for my own self, this has really worked. I'm differentiated enough now where I can go to my family of origin and they can say crazy things and I just consider the source. People are goofy. I can't make sense out of it. It doesn't make sense. One of the things when I was doing a lot of therapy, I said to people, I said, I want to give you one clue that's really going to help you. This woman was coming in and trying to figure it out and trying to fix it. I said, I'm going to give you one rule that's going to help you immensely. She says, what is it? Give it to me. And I said, write this down. She took out a paper and pencil. I want you to write it. I want you to believe it. And every time you get upset, I want you to read it again and believe it and internalize it. And that thing is this. People are crazy. <laughs> Stop trying to make sense out of what they're doing. It doesn't make sense. And let it go. Let go. Well, why does my grandmother... Uh, uh, never mind. Your grandmother does her thing. Well, why does she do it? Never mind. Let it go. Trying to figure it out, trying to intellectualize it, trying to solve the problem. It won't work. It doesn't work. Question. What is the proper acceptable way of getting rid of the anger that has built up in you? It just blows and that would seem to be destructive. What is a good way to prevent that? Good question. I run a lot. I run around Miles Square. Okay? But I'll tell you how it got to me. Since I was right in the middle of my recovery, I'll tell you how it worked with me. When my son was into drugs, and I was at a point where I was at my wit's end, I was about to have a nervous breakdown. Because all my life, I had just been taught, all you got to do is try harder. Stuff those emotions and try harder. And you can work it out. You can figure a way out. And I figured if I could just talk to the kid again, I could talk some sense into him. And I was always doing this. I would think about it. I was obsessed on this. I wasn't going to let him go. There was no way in the world I was going to let him go. And finally, I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And finally, there was just no place else to go. I realized that whatever I did, he was going to do the opposite thing. I couldn't get the police to do it. I couldn't get the hospitals, the doctors to do it. I couldn't do it myself. It was illegal what I wanted to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd lock the little turkey up. That's the only way you could keep him out of the drugs. And so as that began to happen to me, I began to come to the point where I was willing to admit that my method did not work, that control and power did not work, that there was no way I could control another life. There was no way I can save another life through my codependency. There was no way I could live another man's life, whether it was my son or somebody I loved with all my heart and soul or somebody I didn't care about. There's no way that I can make somebody do what I know that they've got to do for the best of them. Do you understand? And I got to a point where I was so emotionally weak, so down, not sleeping, not working, that I got to a point physically where I was exhausted and I allowed myself to cry. First time since like 12. And I cried and it started to come up Years and years of stuffing, years and years of being bad, years and years of being tough, years and years of pent up frustration and anger and rage, and it started to come. And I cried and it came more, and I almost dissociated. My sobs were like a little boy. <gasps> Do you ever, remember when you was little and you'd cry? <sighs> you'd just sob, and I cried and cried and cried and cried. I could not believe it. I was just watching what was happening to me. And I let it go. Of course, do you think I could do that in front of anybody? No. Not that cold yet. I'm still bad. I can go in there and die, come out, but i got to be bad when I come out, right? But I cried and cried and cried. And I came to the realization that I had to let go. So to me, it was cognitive and an emotional experience. So I cried until I realized what was right, that I had to let go. And I gave him back. I said, I cannot... I cannot rescue you anymore. I can't decide for you anymore. I can't protect you anymore. I'm worn out. You win. People, hear this. I let go. By letting go, I got control of my life. Does that sound like AA? When I let go, I took control back for my life. And as long as I was trying to control others, I was out of control. That's part of the, the myth of the dysfunction. Because when you're shamed, you must always be on guard, lest you be discovered, lest your shame be displayed. So you always got to be on guard. Don't talk. Don't tell secrets. Do you see the dysfunctional family? Don't do anything that's going to reveal this. Don't you ever argue in front of people. Always smile. Everything's fine at the Joneses. Everything is fine. It's always fine. We don't have any problems. We don't even go to the bathroom, but very seldom. <laughs> 
we're just totally wonderful. No, no, we don't do that. No, don't do that. We don't do that at all. All right, so the point is, how do you vent this? A lot of times it's done in therapy. For me, it was tears, a cognitive process also of letting go. And now when my son does this stuff, I see it, I observe it, I am amazed that I'm not hooked in emotionally anymore. I've overcome that. I've let go of it. And with my family, my mom and dad, I let go. And they do what they want to do. With my children, I let go. With you, I'm very, very hopeful that you will listen to this. This is so very important for you. I would have given anything I ever made to know this when I was a young man so I wouldn't live 50 years like this. But it wasn't like that for me. I hope that you will not let your children be damaged like this through your dysfunction and through your desires to look good for the sake of the church or for the sake of the school or for the sake of the neighbors. That you'll put that child's interest first. That you will let your child see you cry. That you will let your child see mom and dad upset with each other and look at how mom and dad solve a problem. In a dysfunctional family, mom and dad often are shameless. They're perfect. They don't have any arguments. At least the city doesn't see them, right? So you can't let anybody see this. My son told me, he said, Dad, I thought you were perfect. I said, who on earth could you ever get an idea that whenever something happens, I always cleaned it up. I always explained to him why I did such and such and explained the mistake away. Do you see how dysfunctional that is? Can we admit our humanness? our frailties, our mistakes. What power it would be when a little boy came to dad and he says, Daddy, the bully's beating me up and I'm scared to go to school. You know what my dad said? You go back and you hit him and you catch him just coming around the hall right in the teeth. And if he's really big, you get a two by four and you flatten him on his tail and then you let him know that when they pick on Jones, it's going to cost a mouthful of fur. Okay, it just won't be worth it. Okay, dad, okay. What power it would be when I say I'm afraid, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to go to school. The kid said if I didn't bring him money today, he'd beat me up. He took my lunch money. He got me down and took my lunch money two days in a row. Dad, he's so big, I can't get him off. He sits on me, I can't get him off. He's got this other stupid guy that helps him. And they get me in the bathroom. And i got to go to the bathroom. Do you know it would be worth millions of dollars if that father would say, instead of go back and punch him in the mouth, you know, when I was little, I was scared so bad one time when the bully was chasing me. Dad, were you scared? Yeah, I was scared and I cried when he caught me too. You cried, Dad? Yeah, son, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be afraid. And you learn to handle that. But it's normal to be afraid. I mean, nature put into us a fear sometimes in a logical situation that's fearful. Fear protects us. Our anger protects us and mobilizes us. When I'm taught in my family that it's not right to fear, I'm without a very important defense. In the war, you're supposed to be afraid. Otherwise, you'd stand up when the machine guns are going off. And you're supposed to be angry. Otherwise, you wouldn't fight this incest guy. You're supposed to have a sense of outrage. You're supposed to feel violated. Emotions are an important part of survival. And in the dysfunctional family, you're taught you're not supposed to feel. You're not supposed to think. You're not supposed to want unless we tell you. You want and believe and think what we tell you. That's really, really bad. How important it would be for a little boy to hear his dad say, I was scared to death, son. Yeah, mom and I are having a hard time. We're having a hard time financially instead of pretending. You know, there are no secrets in families. Do you ever hear people say that? The kids sense it. They pick it up. Mom and dad could smile. I knew they weren't getting along. I could tell by what we did. We were having financial problems. My mom picked us up and moved. And dad didn't come? I'm not stupid. I can figure it out. Can you? When we see dad? Well, I don't know. You don't know? No? Is that big time for a little kid? That's big time. That's big time. But that hurts. And in order to stop hurting, I pick up my addictions. I start to focus on work or I focus on sports and I don't have to think about my hurt. I don't have to think about that. And so we start to addict. Well, you see, when I was relieving my anger and my anxiety, let's call it anxiety, okay? Whatever. When I was relieving my anxiety because of the frustrations I had, through work, I was trying to solve an internal problem with an external tool. Do you understand? 
work and church and sex and drugs or alcohol are all external solutions to an internal problem. It ain't going to work. I can alleviate the anxiety for a little while, right? But what happens when the drug wears off? What happens when I come down to the ground? I still got the hurt. And the difference is a healthy way of healing and a sick way of compensating and burying the pain, medicating the pain with alcohol or work or church or sex or rage, some other way to focus off the real problem. I'm suggesting that crying was therapeutic and genuine for me. I wasn't addicted to crying, but crying worked for me. It worked, and I never cried so hard in all my life, nor since. I've tried a couple times because it really felt good, but I've never had that occasion. But you can't see me cry, I can't give that up yet, so I don't cry much in public. It's great to see a movie and allow yourself to cry, isn't it? You women get to cry. My sister fall down and skin her knee. I fall down off the same bike and skin my knee. My bruise is twice as big as hers, and I'm bawling and she's bawling. And they say, oh, you poor little thing. And I'm saying, look. They say, shut up, you weenie. You're a man. You're not supposed to hurt. Stop bleeding. Guys don't bleed. So, man, it doesn't hurt me. Oh, Pete Rose, I saw him one time. They pitcher wound up and threw the ball, and he took it right on the bone on his leg. And you could hear it clear out in center field. Pong. Boy, he didn't bat, and I threw down the bat. He charges over to the first base. You know, after the game, he probably, as soon as he got in the clubhouse, ah, you know, I don't know what he did. I've been hit with a ball that smarts. It was on TV. Do you think he could do that in front of all those fans? Look like a weenie? No, can't do it. We got that macho stuff. So men in America are taught you're not supposed to have feelings. You're supposed to be tough. You're supposed to be super producers. You're supposed to be killers. You're supposed to be aggressive. Those are the roles. And we try to be, and it's not natural, it's not healthy. I want to love, and I want to be loved. I want some emotions. I want to quit making 500 widgets a month more than anybody else and have some time with my wife. I want that. But my code says I've got to compete, and I've got to make more, and I've got to do better. I'm going to read some of this stuff to you. Make a comment here, and then we'll finish with this. I'm not sure how to ask this question, but when you, you go back to the, um, the roles of the children, I'm feeling guilty that my children are, that I have an intelligent child, that I have a child that's an athlete, that I have not forced to be that way. What, why am I feeling guilty because of it? Well, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but I am trying to say that those roles can be exploited and they can be part of a sick system. And if you're saying, I'm so proud of you, you're so good, and you made a touchdown and this, that, and the other, that's in behalf of the parent, and I don't think that's clean. And when the child says, gee, I'm doing well at school or something, you say, gee, that's great. How do you feel about it? And give some strokes, but also give strokes for other things. And give everybody strokes. You need a lot of strokes. We're going to talk about strokes next week with TA. But I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. What I'm trying to say is that when you see a child getting all their strokes by being a heroine or by being a surrogate spouse, I want you to recognize the dysfunction. That you should not bring that child into the marital conflict. That that child should not be going to law school because you didn't get to go. Like in our house. My wife hates this when I say this. They didn't have enough money for her, so she didn't take piano lessons. Guess what my kids do? My kids all take piano lessons, man, and violin lessons and everything else. What is she doing? She's giving them the violin lessons and stuff she didn't have. The piano. Like I say, one generation says, you don't have to do it. I had to take it and I didn't like it, so you don't have to do it, kids. The next generation that didn't have to take it said, hey, you kids need to take violin or need to take piano, right? And they have to take it and they hate it. And then the next generation, what? Man, I had to take piano when I was little, man. You guys don't have to take Every other generation takes piano, okay? <laughs> That's the way it is over our house. I would come home and my wife would have my little 12-year-old son by the throat. <sighs> He'd be blue, bent over the bench, you know. <laughs> kill him, kill him! You know, I can't quite do it. And they would be arguing over piano. I says, hey, what is this all about? I said, I don't want them to grow up like you. You know, all, you know, all your taste in your mouth. I want them to have some culture, piano and the arts. And all I was into is, you know, playing baseball and having fun and all that stuff with them. I said, I would like these boys to have some, some culture. Culture? I thought that's something you did in a dish, you know, in a, in a class. What are you talking about? I said, no, come on, help me, support me. So I, I'd come home and threaten to kill people. You do your piano. You do. Finally, I said, honey, I'm not going to do it anymore. It's destroying the relationship with me. Do you think the relationship's more important than the piano? It really is. 
You can't make everybody do everything, so you've got to pick and choose what your non-negotiables are and allow the child to make a lot of those decisions and put it on them. That education is their responsibility. It's not yours. Do I have to go to school? Well, that's not between you and me. That's between you and the law. You're only two, you know, so you don't have to go yet. But when you have to be five and ten, you need to go or work it out with the school. That's between you and them. Now it's your responsibility for your education. Okay. You cannot not communicate. This is what's happening all the time. You're communicating all the time. 93% of what we communicate is nonverbal. It's through these innuendos and the values that I picked up from my father. Now, this is important. I want to cover this. We talked about the five freedoms, remember? The five freedoms. Virginia Satir said, give the child the right to want what they want. Don't say, no, you don't want that. No, I, I want to play football. No, you don't want to play football. You want to, no, I want to take geometry. No, you want to take Spanish. Let them want what they want to want. No, Mama, I really like vanilla. Hey, in this family, we like chocolate chip, man. What's the matter with you? Why would you like plain vanilla? That's lit, you know? Oh, really? Okay. We all like chocolate chip, right? And none of the guys sing because that's Tilly, okay? You're a real Tilly if you sing. But we beat up people. That's what we do. Okay, and the girls are all into music and good students. The boys are all rotten and alcoholic. And that's what we do here. And that's the way to be a man. But you let them think what they want to think. And you let them feel their real feelings. And when a child is frightened, you let him be frightened. And when he's angry, you let him own his anger. Okay? And don't tell him he's not supposed to feel. And to be the person he wants to be. The power to see and hear and interpret what he wants to hear. Those are the five freedoms. Now, in the dysfunctional family, they have a no-talk rule. Don't tell anybody. A lot of secrets. Lots of secrets. Don't talk. I was told, don't you ever talk about our problems to somebody else. That's nobody else's business. Don't you ever say anything like that. That's disloyal to the family. And part of the big problem you've got when you get into family systems is the innate, instinctive drive for everybody to be loyal to the parents. We idealize our parents. That's the only way we have a surviving in a dysfunctional home. We idealize the parents. We say, my parents are perfect. Because if my parents aren't perfect, then I can't trust. Okay, my three-year-old world of security is gone. So there's a no-talk rule. And there's the denial of the five freedoms. There's unreliability. Whenever you go to somebody with feelings, you can't depend on them. You can't depend on the alcoholic father to be there. You can't depend on the codependent mother to be there for you emotionally either because she's so engrossed and tied into dad. She's just not there. She's unavailable for you. So they never, ever, you never feel like you can rely on somebody. And so I decide that I won't be dependent. I won't rely on anybody anymore. I'll quit relying on people and I'll be independent. And to be a man, I have to be totally independent and not dependent on anybody because dependency is weakness and weakness is awful. Weakness is despicable. Does that make sense? Okay. And then perfectionism. You've got to be perfect. You've got to do it our way. Now, obviously, perfectionism sets you up for failure. Who can be perfect? But you're always trying to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, you have to make it perfect with words or deny the truth. So you've got to be perfect. And control. On another one, I'll, I'll talk about control madness. Okay? You've got to control. And all the relationships are incomplete. Do you think with my addictive father and my codependent mother and this alcohol issue, do you think that game ever? I'm 58. They've been married 59 years. Do you think that codependency game has ever been resolved? Absolutely not. And when dad stopped drinking, they just went on. He just addicted on something else. But the rage continued. The games continue. The find me if you can continued. The games never ever stopped because that was a program that's part of the post-hypnotic trance as he came out of his family of origin. So in completion, the games are never completed. Nothing is ever resolved by either denying that it exists or by constantly keeping it going and keeping feeding. Now some of the games you get into with your kids, the codependency games, the addiction games, or with your husband, they never ever end. And they go on and on and on. And until you are willing to admit them and identify them, they will continue. They'll never stop. Then we have this control madness. You've got to be in control. Because if I ever, ever, ever lose control, then I can't keep covered. I can't keep hidden. 
Does that make sense? Because somebody can expose me and get to me if I'm not in control. So they're in control of everything. In control of the kids. In control of the dinner. In control of the bed making. In control of everything in the world. And so as long as they're in control, they feel safe that nobody will get them. Does that make sense? So they're super controlled. Parents are hyper vigilant with their kids. We went on a picnic and I had all the kids sitting in a row. They were throwing rocks and they were having fun. That was too much for me. And so I had them all sitting down there and I was after them and my wife says, will you leave those kids alone? Let them play. Let them have some fun. I says, honey, they were throwing rocks. Somebody's going to get an eye put out. What if they put out an eye? I'd never forgive myself. So they were all sitting there. Here's this picnic, a nice day. They are all sitting there. And she said, you would be happy on a picnic if they all brought a book and just read it. And I said, that's a great idea, you know. <laughs> Do you see where I'm coming from? I was afraid they'd hurt themselves, afraid they'd cut themselves. I would lecture the babysitter a half hour you know, before we left. I couldn't trust anybody. I had to be in control. Do you see the trust issue coming out? I couldn't trust anybody. Nobody was capable. And then also blame. The dysfunctional family is always blaming because they can't take blame. They've always got to be right, so they're going to blame. And this is the blame game. And as long as I'm blaming you, what happens? I don't have to work on my stuff. Yeah, wives say all the time, i got to get my husband in here. I say, well, you're in here, let's work. Well, i got to get my husband in here. He's the problem. <laughs> then, then the husband calls me up. My wife's going to come in and see you. Here's the deal. Okay, here's how to fix her. Does that make any sense? And as long as I'm blaming you and it's your problem, as long as I attack, remember, the best defense is a what? Good offense. As long as I'm blaming, then I don't have to do anything. So the blame game goes on and on and on. It's very profitable. And in therapy, that's one of the first things you got to do. I have a little deal with my people that come in for marriage counseling. I say, one of the things we do is we only work on our own stuff. You willing to do that? We only work on our own stuff. You can't live your husband's life and he can't live yours. From today on, we only talk about our own stuff and how you're going to improve the relationship. If the wife improves 500% and the husband improves 500%, how will that work? Oh, that's great. You think she will? You know? <laughs> I said, that's not the issue. The issue is what are you going to do to contribute to this relationship? Okay, but they're both trying to change for the other one. Get him to this and get her to do that. And they're doing that all the time. That's the first thing. One of the very first things in marriage counseling I, I get onto. One is you've got to accept their truth. Whatever they say is their truth, as goofy as it may be. Well, she's always chasing me. That's why I withdraw. And she says, well, he always withdraws. That's why I chase. Who knows when that got started? Do you think that coming out of a family, do you think that a father who is always withdrawn, say he has a little girl here, and he's very withdrawn, and the girl is pretty much chasing that father? trying to be intimate with that father, trying to connect with that father, needing that father's relationship, and he's withdrawn. Maybe she's getting at an age where she's starting to get sexual or something, you know, starting to develop a little bit, 13 or 14, and so he sees that and he feels awkward there. It's no longer kind of appropriate for her to jump on his lap. Do you, you know what I'm saying? And he's kind of turning off on this and he's kind of pushing her away and she can't understand that. And so can you see her going out and marrying some guy that's pretty distant that she has to chase? Do you think anything like that could happen? Happens all the time. She's trying to finish that relationship with her father, trying to connect, and she can spend the rest of her life chasing a guy like that. Some guy that was there for her and says, Honey, I think you're wonderful. Talk to me. Look at me. Let's be intimate. She goes, Ah! You know, and runs the other way. When that big dog came into the yard and scared the heck out of my kids, you know, I went running down the road, screaming after that dog, praying that I'd never catch it, you know. He didn't want to catch it. Okay, that's the way it goes. All right. So the blame and myth-making. One of ours was, aren't we fortunate that we have such a beautiful family? Aren't we fortunate that we have such a close family that is so close and loves each other so much that we have such a good family, better than other families, better than any other families? Everybody compliments us on that. You know, I never heard anybody compliment us. That was all out of my mother's head. She was making a myth, and you know, that where everything is perfect in our house as I step over father, okay, and come into the house. What's the matter with dad? Oh, he's just resting. How come he smells so funny? How come he's always resting after payday? How come he disappears? Okay, not admit it. Never admit it. Never admit the truth. It's somebody else's fault my kid does this. Always myth-making. My children are wonderful. They love me. She's an old witch and they hate her. All right, functional families. 
Here's some stuff for functional families. People, I'm telling you stuff, I'm going to tell you stuff about my family. Again, not because you need to know about my family. I want you to relate to this and see how it's going on in your family so you can recognize the dysfunction. I can be the bad example. It's okay. I'm a real good bad example. Okay, in functional families, they studied functional families and they found several things that were very, very common. They studied families where the kids were good. That's what they did. They took these ideal kids and they studied them and they found some very, very special things. And some of the things they found had, they measured them on control, the efforts to influence the children's behavior or their goal orientation and to modify the expression of dependent aggressiveness and playfulness behavior, etc. They talked about control here and how well the, the children internalized the, the parental standards. And they measured them along lines of maturity demands, how much the parents demanded the kids be mature, how clear the parents' communications were, and also how much nurturing the parent did. And they graded them on those four things. And they found a very, very significant thing. And what they found was that those families who had well-adjusted children who were very independent, very mature for their ages, self-reliant, very active in their school, etc., into real good self-control that they loved to explore and study. They were very friendly, seemed well-adjusted, and achievement-oriented. Would you like to have kids like that? Mm -hmm. Well, they studied children's families like that. They studied the parents of children like that. This concludes the program on this side of the cassette. To continue the program, please turn the cassette over. Well, they studied children's families like that. They studied the parents of children like that. Not that just had one kid like that, but they had a lot of kids like that. And there seemed to be some common threads going through it. And let me give you some of these. Number one, these functional families held the children accountable for what the children did. And let me give you some of these. Number one, these functional families held the children accountable for what the children did. Intent was irrelevant. I didn't mean to. They didn't listen to that. Like the guy told he was in, a, in the car. They'd just been to Disneyland. And they were kind of tired. And they all had balloons. Now they get in the van and they've got all these big balloons there. And then brother, one of the older brothers, fussing around, popped the little kid's balloon. Pow! And he cried and he sobbed. And the father said, Johnny, who was the older boy, you've been responsible for breaking so-and-so's balloon. Give him your balloon. Now, whatever you think about this, the issue here is accountability. That's what I want you to see. You may agree or not agree with this. But the boy was accountable for what he did. And they, the children are always held accountable. And the boy sobbed and he gave it to him. The next day, the father felt terrible about this. The next day, the father talked to the son about it and said, I know you didn't mean to, but nevertheless, your rambunctiousness and playing around caused a damage to somebody else's stuff. And you're accountable for what you do. You have to answer for what you do. Do you understand this? Yes. And if you break something, you're responsible for it. You have to answer for what you say. You have to answer for what you do every single time. And families that required that raised children who were accountable. They trained them to be accountable. And they thought, looked before they leaped. Does that make sense? The other thing they found out that these children were very responsible. And why were they responsible? They accepted responsibility because when they were teeny on, the parents gave them a little responsibility, then a little more responsibility. I'm talking about chores around the house. Responsibility for their own clothing. Responsibility has to do with things, too, okay? Accountability has to do with actions. So they're accountable for what they do, and they say damages to other people. But they're responsible. They have to do their, their yards. They have to do their room. They have work to do. They are responsible for their own clothing. They're responsible to carry their own weight in the home. It's a very, very important thing. And it has to be something the parent has up front in their thinking all the time, that they're going to have that child be responsible. And they're going to give the child more and more responsibility so that when the child leaves home, the child is totally responsible for their own behavior. That they can make money, that they can study, that they can work, that they have integrity, etc. All of those virtues. Another thing they found was a very, very good communication or a sensitivity. There was lots of dialogue and not always positive. Dad would say, I think that stinks. The kid would say, well, I think you stink too. But they were talking. They weren't stuffing feelings. Do you understand? There's lots and lots of sensitivity. And the parents were constantly giving positive strokes 
a lot more positive strokes than negative comments. Remember that ratio we talked about, 1 to 10 for positive instead of 25 bad ones to one good one? That's very important. So this communication thing is vital. Understanding the parents were very, very empathetic. This is all under communication. They were very supportive of what the kids wanted to do. They were empathetic and understanding of the children. They were gentle, not harsh. They were gentle with the children. They were loving. Is that all communication? They were kind, and they had mutual respect. They insisted on that. And there were consequences. Instead of talking, they would act. The consequences were the parents follow through every time. There was consequences for anything they said or they did. So consequences. And finally, they had family unity. Family unity had to do with having family councils. They had lots of family councils and lots of family government. And the children had a great influence over the parents through the medium, the forum of this family council. They could talk, they could disagree, they had permission to disagree, they had permission to express themselves, and dad and mom wasn't saying, well, we're dad and mom and that's the way it is, tough. Mom and dad listened, and mom and dad heard, and mom and dad adjusted, and they gave the children great uh, weight in, in being responsible for the, running the home. And so those are the things that responsible families have. Now, there's a lot of other stuff. Let me give you some ideas of what you're doing in your home. These are some things that I wrote up in a paper I had to write about rules, rituals, and myths. Let me give you some of these. Now, I want you to ask yourself, after you hear this today, what values, what rules, what myths are you passing on to your children in what you do in the way you have Christmas, in the way you have Thanksgiving, in your celebrations, or whatever. Here's my mother's ritual whenever we'd go into a restaurant. Listen to this, people. When we went out to eat, mom would always go through the same ceremonial behavior. First, dad was sent in for a cleanliness report. We would park and dad would go in and reconnoiter. He'd go in there and take a look. Does it look clean? How's it smell? Okay. If it passed, dad would come out. Okay. We would go in. At the table, mom would carefully inspect each glass, holding them up to the light for any clues of disease. She would reject a glass or two with a look of revulsion and then vigorously dry scrub and polish each knife and fork. I'm 10 years old watching this, okay? <laughs> what is going on? What's the message that's coming through? Next, the table would feel sticky. Now, mom would always discard a glass or two. They might have been perfect, I don't know. She'd discard a glass or two and make the waiter bring another one, or the waitress. Next, the table would feel sticky or greasy. No, if it wasn't sticky, it was greasy. Okay, look at this. Oh, it's, you know, no way to win. I wouldn't want to be a waiter there. Next, the table would feel sticky or greasy, and she would take the waiter's cloth from him and re-wipe the table, not forgetting under the salt and pepper shakers. When the food arrived, she would carefully poke in and under everything and give it the Jones sniff test for freshness. The rule was we are clean, but most people are not. I still feel restaurants are not clean. And guess what I'm thinking? You know, I, I go in a restaurant, it's spoiled. I'm thinking about cockroaches. Okay? Think about cockroaches next time you go into a restaurant. I want you to have the full impact of what I'm talking about. Okay? And check in everything. You will find bugs and you will do that. If you're good, if you're a good inspector. It really bothers my sister. She looked visibly worried and became an inspector too. Guess what my sister does? See, I don't care. I was in the army and I was overseas and I eat anything. As long as it doesn't outcrawl me. Okay? Now, this was dad's restaurant ritual. This was dad's part. In the restaurant, when we pick up the menus, dad's eyes would dart back and forth from like this. He'd be going down from, from item to price. This is what he'd be doing. And I knew it was coming. I was just hoping one of my friend's family didn't own the restaurant or something, you know. I'd be sitting there. He'd, his eyes would dart back and forth between selection and price, and then he'd frown. If he didn't frown, the ritual didn't kick in. Now, I could tell you what's going to happen. This is what they always did at a restaurant. Now, some of you are smiling. Do you have anything similar to this? He would comment on the ridiculous prices or say he wouldn't pay these robbers. There was... And guess, did you think he said it quietly? No. There was always an uncomfortable moment for me when I didn't know if we'd go or stay. I was embarrassed when we left, you know. You know, I was a big, a big grin, you know. Like we'd forgot our money or something, you know? 
We couldn't afford the hamburger, right? <laughs> I was embarrassed. But today I'll leave if I see outrageous prices. I don't want to feel like I'm trapped. Dad would ask questions about the food that were more calculated to irritate the waiter than to get information. <laughs> well, where'd you get the meat? Is it fresh? When did it come in? What was that beef fed? What was this? This isn't that cheap stuff, is it? We've, we've been to places like that. The waiter's, you know. <laughs> no, he was just trying to get a rise, right? Just trying to get him mad. I'm sitting there, Dad, you know, I'll have a hamburger, you know. <laughs> Any way you want to bring it. Okay. When the food came, he'd get angry because it was not what he had ordered. It was too salty, raw, cold, or too small a serving for such a terrible price. And he'd talk about it. And people near us would hear. And I'd get lower and lower in my seat. And they'd say, who wants to go out to dinner? I got a ball game. If the waiter was insolent, or got a look on his face, you know, if the waiter was insolent or slow or the price is too high, he'd leave a 10 cent tip to register his dissatisfaction and chuckle about it on the way home. See, if you didn't leave anything, they might think you forgot. Right? He'd say, he'd chuckle, say, we'd go on the home. <laughs> yeah. They're out to get you, son. Don't let anybody get you, son, because they will if you're dumb enough to let them. Dad was an alcoholic. Can you see this? Was he winning the game? He was always into the game. What was the message on the first one about this restaurant thing? <clears throat> that the world's toxic. You can't trust people. You can't depend on people. They're filthy. Public bathroom ritual. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pup. Hey, do you do any of this stuff? Come on, ladies. You do this? Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Man, by the time I was three, man, I could put three of those toilet seat covers on. Perfect. You know? Okay. Public bathrooms were described as any non-family bathroom. That means my family. Cousins, you couldn't trust. Grandma and Grandpa, you don't know who they let in to sit on that thing. So you never can trust anything. Don't trust it. It's filthy. You can't see it, but it's filthy, and you will get sick, big time sick. Don't you let that get on your little bum, because that's it. Okay. The world is a toxic place, and whenever we absolutely had to use a public toilet, Mother would look worried. Mommy, I got to go. Can't you wait? No, Mommy. No, Mommy. I got to go. Really? Yeah, Mommy. <laughs> Dancing around on one leg. You wait till it's, you know, about to pop. Okay? Mother would look worried. You cannot wait. Is that right? And I got big enough where I couldn't go in with her anymore. Before you went in the ladies' room, right? So you could handle everything. But now I couldn't because I knew the difference. No, I'd be dead before you caught me in the ladies' room. That's what twits did with their mamas. Okay? Okay, mother would look worried and remind us of the safety precautions of which we had been thoroughly trained. In the john, I double the paper on the seat. In washing my hands, I touch the faucet handles only with the tips of two fingers and use tons of soap. As I left the restroom, I'd use a paper towel to open the door. Because people did not wash their hands and there were VD germs on the handles. Now, I had no idea what VD was, but I knew I didn't want to get it, whatever it was. And so this VD stuff was all over, and I didn't want any of it. See, sometimes I'd get stuck in there, or the door would open the wrong way, or there wouldn't be any toilet paper, and I'd have to wait till somebody came in, because if I couldn't open it with my elbow or something like that. Can you see what she's done, this little neurotic little guy she's created? Now, you can think, do you know, today, I will notice who does not wash their hands in the bathroom. I make note, and I'm bothered by it, and I think that's really wrong, and in an imposition, a terrible travesty on humanity to walk out with dirty old hands. And it really bothers me, much, deep, still, because that's a responsibility to the rest of us, right? To wash with soap. So I always get a paper towel and get out the door, because people, has that VD stuff, or whatever it is, okay? <laughs> Back at the table, mom was usually satisfied after some questions. This scared the devil out of me when I was young. Sometimes I'd get into a toilet and there was no soap nor towels and I'd be trapped in there. I'd use toilet paper to touch the door going out or just use my little fingers to turn the knob. To this day, I feel icky until I get my hands scrubbed after I've been in public places or touched an animal or something. Do you guys do any of this? You're tweaking your kids. The Christmas present ritual. Listen to the message here. Did you get the message in the toilet one? 
the Christmas present ritual. This was a little more subtle. As the presents began to pile up under the tree the week before Christmas, I noticed that Mom always carefully opened each present received to get a little peek at what had been given. She would then expertly close the package and replace it under the tree. The ritual was completed on Christmas Eve when we had all piled into the car and deliver our presents to friends and relatives. The message is, we can help others and we can give, but we don't accept help and we're never outgiven. When I'm out with friends for dinner, I usually insist on paying the check even when I can't afford it. See, everybody wants to go out to dinner with me. No, but I've got over that, so don't worry about it. <laughs> There's a bunch of other rituals that I'll skip for the sake of time. The kitchen ritual, a couple more here. There's a right and a wrong way to do things, and it's vital to maintain control and order. Do you hear where I'm coming from? See this compulsiveness? I'm compulsive about doing the dishes. It's got to be done just right. When you're clearing dishes from the table, there is a prescribed and understood way to stack the dishes on the sink. And there are exact spots where glasses, plates, and silverware go. Dishes are washed in specific order. Small plates, large plates, glasses, bowls, pans, and silverware. You laughing? I can see a lot of grin. Is that true? How many agree that's the way to do it? That's right. You got it right. Glasses first? Depends. Did I leave glasses out? When others do dishes, I am troubled at their disorganization. They just jump in and wash anything they can get their hands on, whether they have a clean place to set it or not. Helter skelter, no order, no class. That really bothers me. I'll be washing dishes at somebody's place, and they'll come slip in a greasy gravy spoon right in the dishwater. And if I don't hit them, I'll leave. You know, I was doing the dishes. Get out of here. I will do the dishes correctly. That's half the satisfaction in doing them. If I got to do them, they will be done correctly. <laughs> exactly right. Is this compulsive? Do you see my nature? Get your hand out of that water before you lose an arm. <laughs> you want me to do the dishes? I'll do them. You just don't mess with me. <laughs> Somebody come in and slip a dish with a half a piece of pie on it in your dishwater. Like, where were they raised? You know, in a, you know, in a swill? You know. Okay. Here's something to give you a little insight. It's a little personal, but listen. This is the vomiting ritual. <laughs> now listen to this. This is where I learned a lot of stuff here. Now this is the truth. I'm not making this up. This is where I grew up, uh, 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 you know? <laughs> All right. Okay. When I was young and I got sick and it was time to throw up, I'd stick my head in the toilet, groan, and heave. So far, so good, Okay. Mom would hold my forehead in her hand and rub my back as I convulsed in agony. Let's get it all, honey. Got some more nasty to get out? There, that's a good boy. Feel any better? Then the glass of water to rinse with and a warm washcloth for the messy face and tears. The gentleness of her hands and the kindness of the act helped me to learn compassion and caring for others. I loved her and knew I was important and deeply loved. My wife says she gets absolutely no attention from me. And then she's sick. Guess what happens? Fall out of the tree. Whatever you want and cooked it. You know what I mean? Just do whatever is necessary to make her happy. So she's sick a lot. All right. (laughs) The Easter egg ritual. In my family, you ate everything on your plate and never wasted a thing. It's a sin to waste. In normal families... This is a slam at my wife's family. You boiled eggs, you dried them, marked them, hid them, hunted for them, found them, looked at them, enjoyed them, and ate them. But in my wife's family, at Easter, they went to the canyons and rolled Easter eggs down the hill. When we married, I could not allow this practice. It was so wickedly wasteful. Are you crazy, I asked? Don't they break and get ruined? Some of them do, but it sure is fun. She answered. Unfortunately, I prevailed. My children are grown, and now I think I'd like to roll some Easter eggs. My wife had a rule I never learned. Having fun doesn't have to make sense. How many of you know about rolling Easter eggs? He's got some weirdos here. You actually go up and roll them down the hill, right? Isn't that something? I don't know. Okay. See? Eat everything on your plate. Another idea of a rule. Born of the Depression, eat everything on your plate, is an example 
of a conscious rule, an overt explicit rule. Today I still eat everything on my plate and I'm upset when others waste food. Another rule was that sustained in our eating ritual was since life is unpredictable, we must save and never waste anything because it's a sin to waste. The impact on my life, I married a girl from a very modest farm background who also eats everything on her plate. When we were courting, when I took her out to dinner, guess what? When we were courting, she ate everything off her plate. And I thought, wow. <laughs> you spend five bucks on some gal, and she'd take a nibble at this and a nibble at that. And I was incensed. <laughs> I spent five bucks on you, and you took two bites. Last time, turkey. Sayonara, get you home right away. Still time to call somebody else. Okay? I mean, that just burned me. And I see people in restaurants today that will order a $10 meal and the kids will take a couple bites and they throw it away. That's a crime. That's horrible to me. So as a result, between the two of us, we've collected a home and a garage full of things we can't throw out because they might be needed in hard times to if ever come again. You see, these rules are I kiss and hug mom but shake dad's hand and call him sir. All of these values, some of this came from the South. You always walk on the outside of the grill and you always go in the dark house first and you step down first off the streetcar and you always protect the girl. You give your life for the girl. That's part of the Southern ritual. And so I would do this. You'd never ever hit a girl, ever, ever, no matter what they did. You'd never lay a hand on a girl. And so I never have, even when they deserved it. Okay? And that was a big thing with me. I can remember uh, these girls being so ornery and nasty, I felt powerless. It's part of my rage around this woman issue that gave me such a bad time. But then I decided to get married and raise some weird kids, and I did. All right, now, how to break away from this? What is all this talk about? This talk is about coming to grips and realizing what can be happening. Is this to have anything to do with parenting? It has everything to do with parenting because the parents are the most impactful thing in a child's life, especially up to three years old. It's terribly important what you do and what you communicate with that child. If you come across that the world is toxic, that people can't be trusted, that the world is dangerous only, that no one's to be trusted, nothing is clean, you're going to do damage. There needs to be a balance between trust and mistrust. There needs to be a balance. Okay, for a quick minute, the women are set up for code of... All right, the women are almost perfect. Would you disagree? But women are set up in our society to be codependent. You're set up in this servient role. You're set up real heavy duty to rescue. You're a good mother if you do everything for your husband, if you do everything for your child, and you're the world's best codependence. And so I use myself as a bad example, but the principles are the same and they apply to the women. It's my mother that's the codependent. She was set up that her role was to take care of a man. Her role was to take care of children. I'm not suggesting that's wrong. I'm suggesting it's wrong if you don't take care of yourself too. If you think that you have to be spent and that you have to be used up in a martyr role, in a victim role forever and ever waiting on lazy kids. That's codependency. That's not health. And you have to know the difference. And these kids are supposed to suffer and they're supposed to work and they're supposed to learn. Does that make sense? And these women are just set up for codependency. And they look for weak men often to feel needed and to feel to work out their codependency. And they were set up in the home to do that. There's a comment here. So codependency can be one of your addictions. Yes. Codependency is an addiction. The co-addict, we call it here. The co-dependent. They're also dependent. Except they're not dependent on booze. They're dependent on sick people. They've got to make their children sick so that the kids need them forever. They've got to make, keep their husbands sick and keep rescuing and keep the game going so that they feel wonderful and they feel great so that they can be martyred. We're going to talk about the drama triangle next week about the victim and the martyr, okay? The persecutor. And that will come very evident to you next week. But this co-addict here, the co-dependent, will create a situation where the kids need them and they can't get away. They don't want the kids to be independent. They keep them dependent with allowances and not letting them take care of themselves and rescuing and enabling. Lee told me a story the other day. Lee, I hope we got time for this. He went over there with the, went over the place. The lady came over to his house and says, I need you to, I need some help to do my yard. It's overgrown, totally overgrown. I don't know what I'm going to do. 
So Lee went over there kind of with a half idea he'd take care of it. She had about a week's work there. It was really like a jungle. He goes over there and, and this guy walks out of the house. And he says, well, who's that? Oh, that's my son. Oh, well, what does he do? Oh, he lives here. Well, has he got a job? No. Well, what's he doing? Oh, he lives here. Well, how old is he? 43. Here's this little old lady with a 43-year-old son that she's supporting. Is that codependency? He's waiting for her to die and take and sell the house and have some money. Is that sick? Do you think she can see it? Think she can kick him out? She can't kick him out. They're so tied together, that's a symbiotic relationship. And it's never matured. The kid has never broken away. She's kept that kid. 